Okay, we're going to go and go ahead and get started. Welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the C3 AI DTI seminar series for the fall semester. My name is Richard Zhang, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. I am co-organizing and co-hosting this semester's seminar series with Gary Joshi, who is an associate professor at CNU. C3 AI DTI features research that focuses on studying how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data can lead to scientific breakthroughs with large scale societal benefits. Uh, here, before we begin, we would like to pause to acknowledge the support from our academic and industry partners for which we are deeply grateful. Our fall 2022 series is organized around two special things, adversarial machine learning and distributed and federated learning. Our talks are scheduled to alternate between these two themes over alternating weeks. Uh, as we can see here, we have some really exciting speakers lined up for the semester. Just to give you an idea, uh, for the next few, next four weeks, we'll be hearing from Suvat Shra from MIT, Bo Lee from UIUC, Brendan McMahon from Google and Zico Coulter from CMU. And our series will extend all the way out to December with a speeches, uh, speakers featured here. You can find the details of the speaker information and abstracts on our website. And you can also find the abstracts for future talks uh, on our website, as well as links to videos of previous talks, both from the current seminar series, as well as the past series will be all available on our YouTube channel. We invite you to subscribe to our newsletters and our channel so that you don't miss these talks. So today we're very happy to welcome Professor Raghunathan to share her research with her talk entitled, The Many Facets of Robust Machine Learning from Mathematical Guarantees to Real World Shifts. Uh, professor Raghunathan is an assistant professor at, of computer science at the University uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. She is interested in building robust ML systems with guarantees for trustworthy real world deployment. Previously, she was a postdoctoral researcher at Berkeley AI Research and received her PhD from Stanford University in 2021. Her research has been recognized by the Arthur Samuel Best Thesis Award at Stanford, a Google PhD Fellowship in Machine Learning and an Open Philanthropy AI Fellowship. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Raghunathan. The talk will be 15 minutes. For the audience, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. We'll ask them on your behalf at the end of the talk. Uh, Professor Raghunathan, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. And thanks, Richard, for that kind introduction. And thanks for having me here. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, okay, so welcome. And in this talk today, I wanted to share a sort of high level overview of how I've been thinking about robust machine learning over the years and how that has been changing. So this will be pretty high level and maybe a little informal and I'll be talking about a lot of different things, but as much as possible and time permitting, I'll try to go into some technical results and intuition at least. Yeah, so definitely this is a really exciting time to be in machine learning. And it was that way when I started my PhD as well. And I remember seeing this AlphaGo result and like many other people, I was really excited about what all we can do with machine learning. And you know, since then it seems like this has only accelerated and we've been seeing many such impressive results. For example, it seems like a machine learning model today can actually understand pretty non-trivial jokes and explain them. And most recently there've been some really impressive image generation results with creative captions that are coming out of these large machine learning models. So when you see such impressive eye-catching results, it's natural to try to use machine learning to solve a lot of problems around us. For example, we might want to use it in, uh, to revolutionize things like medicine or science, but also to make everyday life easier around us. And you know, we, we see that machine learning is increasingly used in many applications, ranging from voice assistance, translations, online content filtering, and so on. So this is all great. Um, but my research is inspired by trying to look at how well these machine learning models actually do when we try to take them and use them in the real world. 
So here's a headline from 2015 um, that perhaps a lot of you are familiar with, where it was seen that facial recognition systems do not work very well on certain demographics. So this issue did receive a lot of attention and you know, are things better, but even five years later, we continue to see such um, results uh, or like such headlines about what happens. For example, this time a black person was wrongly arrested. So I remember like when looking at 2015, like what did they do to address this issue? And the solution that they came up with was to simply remove the word gorilla from their captioning lexicon. And it seems like, you know, it's now it's no longer surprising that these systems are still broken because we need some fundamental ways to address these. Let's look at another domain of self-driving cars. Again, we've been hearing a lot about self-driving cars and, you know, unfortunately things are not that great when we try to use these self-driving cars in real world situations. For example, in 2018, a woman was tragically killed where among other issues, um, a machine learning model failed to recognize a pedestrian who was jaywalking because it was only trained to recognize pedestrians at crosswalks. And you know, I just recently searched, and even in 2022, we see headlines like nearly 400 car crashes in 11 months um, based when we try to actually use these machine learning based models in the real world. So on the one hand, we have these really impressive results showcasing the promise of machine learning. But at the same time, we see that machine learning systems currently are quite brittle when we try to use them in the real world. And as we are going to try to use machine learning more and more around us, it's really important to try to think about how do we make these ML systems more robust? So, you know, so starting my PhD, I was like trying to think about how do we try to make these systems more robust? So going back to what, what is the source of the issue here? Like, why do we have this dichotomy in the first place? So when we typically think of machine learning, what we do is we collect a data set of examples and they could come from some distribution fee. And then we split this into train and test. We train on the training data and we evaluate how well the machine learning model does on this held out test set. So we typically only evaluate on examples from the same distribution fee that the training data was obtained from. Most benchmarks and as well as the classical learning theory setting study this setting. And of course, there are a lot of interesting things we don't understand here, but this is clearly insufficient if we think about real world deployment because what a model is going to encounter in the real world is a wide range of examples, sorry, is a wide range of examples, including those that are potentially not from the same distribution that your training data was obtained from. So my goal was to try to make machine learning work well on this wide range of examples that the model could encounter when it's deployed in the real world. So now a natural question is, how do I define what is this large range of examples that I should think about that the model could encounter? And how do we set this up? So to do that, we can look at some examples of what we might care about. So one situation, for example, in driving, which is perhaps a little close to home for me right now, is you know, we might have collected data and trained a model to work under certain weather conditions in certain geography, but we all know that weather can change and predictably things can go wrong. And so we want the models to work well in all these conditions. So I guess in a few months, I'll see whether I am robust, but we definitely want our self-driving cars to be robust to all weather conditions. And similarly, for example, inspired by the crosswalks uh, example from before, we want to make sure like there can be all kinds of pedestrian activity and we still want the model to work well. Similarly, you could have hospitals and different demographics or different regions. We want to still work very well. And you know, we want to work well on all demographics and subpopulations, not just that which is majority or highly representative in that distribution of the training data. And similarly, we could have people who are trying to break these systems actively when it's deployed. For example, if you have content filtering, people are going to try to introduce ways to surpass these systems and still post their content online. So we want to work when you have adversaries who are also trying to break this system. So one thread that kind of came out in all these, if I think about these different applications, because you want to work well in some kind of a worst case fashion. So this could be across all subpopulations, all adversaries, all weather conditions and so on. So that led us to think about like, you know, how do we capture what is the worst case uh, performance? And you know, that leads to a really nice way to think about robustness. So that is what we, uh, what is often called robust optimization or robust machine learning. So in the classical setup, like we saw earlier, we have some training data from a distribution P and we just evaluate on a new example from the same distribution P. Instead, in this robust ML framework, 
we still have the same training data. So we want to evaluate performance, not just on this one distribution in P that matches your training data, but rather we define a bunch of different distributions that the model could have encountered. And we define this via this you know, some set C of P. And we want the model to work well in all these different distributions. In other words, we want the worst case performance across all distributions within the set to be good, not just that one particular distribution of your training data. Right, so you know, if you want to visualize this, so you have one distribution which corresponds to your training data, but we have the set of distributions around the training data, and we want to work well on all these distributions. For example, this could include, uh, you know, you have different sub, you have like some population with different subpopulations. We want to work well on each of those subpopulations independently, not just on the, you know, the majority or whatever is highly representative in that one distribution P. So I thought this is a very elegant and interesting way to think about robust machine learning because now we can mathematically write what we want and this lets us to do something with uh, trying to make models more robust, right? So in the first few years of my PhD, I was kind of interested in thinking about this robust ML or robust optimization framework. And the way I thought this whole thing would come together was we first need to understand what it means to make models robust for some particular uncertainty set. So we typically call this uncertainty sets in terms of, you know, for historical reasons, but basically whatever, you have ways of defining this uh, set C of P around your training data, and you have different ways of defining that. But we just need to understand the fundamentals of once we have this definition, how do we make a model robust to that definition? And then I you know, imagine that we can approximate various real world distribution shifts as some combination of you know, different uncertainty sets. And given that we know how to solve for one uncertainty set, we put everything together and we get a model that actually works on realistic distribution shifts. So with this agenda in my mind, I start thinking about like, okay, let's try to understand if we knew an uncertainty set, how do we get good performance rather than just like one distribution P, but in worst case across all this set of distribution C of P. So I wanted to uh, first share like what we found in this, you know, trying to make models robust under this uh, simple setting where we assume we know a set a C of P, which is well-defined and we just want to make the model robust in the worst case across the set. Okay, so you know, what are the aspects or ingredients that go into a typical machine learning pipeline? So we decide what is the training data. We decide what is the model architecture. We put them together and optimize some training objective. And that gives us some model parameters. And then we evaluate this model parameter. Right, so what all do we think we need to change when we want to make mod, uh, machine learning models robust under this like robust optimization framework? So it seems natural that we want to incorporate some notion of robustness within the training objective. And most work in robust machine learning actually focuses on, you know, how do we incorporate robustness into the objective and like, um, you know, uh, what is the right objective? But when we went down this route, it turns out that, okay, so sorry, just to say what that would look like. Um, in classical ML training, we want to get a model that works well on a held out example from this distribution P. And the way we obtain that is to you know, train a model such that we minimize the same metric on the empirical distribution. So we want to work on the test set where we just optimize the same metric on the training set and for various reasons and regularization and some deep learning magic nowadays, it seems like this works. And so the natural analog for robust ML would be let's optimize the robust objective on the empirical set. And so this is the most straightforward extension of what we know from normal machine learning, which changed the objective that we care about. So let's change the training objective to basically match the objective we care about, but on the empirical or like the training data that we have. So this is the kind of backbone of robust ML training. Okay, so, but that seems natural. But what we found was actually, that's not the only thing that has to change, that all of these other aspects that are in the pipeline, they also actually have to change in pretty non-trivial ways in order to make things robust. For example, the very fact that we've changed the objective to now include a worst case within its definition changes the way we need to think about evaluating these trained models. So I'll talk about that. And the same way, like, you know, the fact that we're defining this notion of robustness also changes the kind of training data and model architecture and how they interact when we try to train models. And it's not just the question of changing the objective. So I'll you know, show a few results around that space as well, but why it's not so simple as just changing one objective to another when we want to make models robust. 
Okay, so one concrete example that I'll go into within this robust optimization framework first is adversarial examples. I think these are very intuitive ways to think about like what this uh, you know, uncertainty set or what this set of things we want to be robust to are. So here's an example. So, okay, so the informal goal is that we want to def uh, defend against or like basically work well, even when there are some perturbations to the inputs. So maybe a model works well on certain input, but we change that in a small way and the model should continue to work well on that input. So if, if an example here is a stop sign which any machine learning model today would correctly classify as a stop sign. And then now you can add these black and white, you know, innocuous looking stickers to UNI, but somehow models will completely confuse themselves and call this a speed limit sign instead. So here's one example of how you can perturb an input in a very, in a way that doesn't change any semantics and somehow models work badly and we want to fix this. As another example for content filtering. So this can be correctly classified as toxic. But we can just introduce one single typo here, and now suddenly the model thinks it's non toxic. So, models don't work very well when you change uh, inputs by small perturbations, and we want to try to fix that. And a more extreme case of this is a, um, uh, okay, so I guess just to set up some notation, or the way to think of this is that you have an input and you have this set of perturbations around it, and we allow an adversary to perturb an input to any point within this set, and we want the model to work well. So we were initially thinking about perturbations at the level of um, distributions, but we can actually map that to perturbations at instance level, um, which is what adversarial examples are about. And so this could be stickers, or this set could have like typos, or sort of the most uh, canonical and you know striking example of adversarial examples are these pixel changes. So here's an image which is a lake shore, and again a good model today would correctly classify it as a lake shore. But I can change each pixel by a really small amount to get the image at the bottom. That still very much looks like a lake shore to you and I, but the model would call it a completely different class of laptop. And this is actually pretty striking because it says that even imperceptible changes can actually break your model. And so this uh, vulnerability actually got a lot of attention because you know it's, it's kind of bizarre that the image looks exactly the same to us, but the model thinks it's pretty different. And so there's like a very fundamentally different way in which models make their predictions. So that got a lot of people excited about trying to solve this problem, but you know this is well studied, like this is very concrete, like we know exactly what we want, yet this is actually a pretty unsolved um, we made progress, but it's not completely solved. So what makes that challenging? So like, why is even the simplest way of thinking about robustness actually so challenging to achieve in practice? So here's a brief history. So like I said, a lot of people have been thinking about adversarial examples and a lot of papers have been written. Um, so for example, in 2013 was like the paper that first sort of, you know, reported this observation and documented it. And very quickly, there were ideas on how we can maybe solve this problem. So the Issue was not the lack of having ideas to defend it, but the problem became that you had a paper that claimed to be a defense, but very quickly, there was another way of attacking or another way of perturbing within the same definition, but you just search better within that set, and now you can break this defense. And you know, very strikingly, like there was this claim in a blog post that you, know, you didn't need to worry about adversarial examples, and just five days later, this claim was shown to be broken. And in 2018, the ICML best paper actually broke seven of the eight defenses that were published at the previous iClear conference. This was one of like the big challenges in the, you know, trying to make models robust, which is that we didn't have a way to actually know if we're even robust in the worst case or not, because in order to evaluate this worst case perturbation, we needed to, like people were using heuristics and those heuristics can simply just be broken by doing something smarter after you publish your defense. So that got us interested in thinking about, is there a way we can actually get any model that we have some sense of a guarantee about so that at least we know the model is not going to be broken by having someone attack it in a stronger attack within the set that we've already defined. So within this particular definition of what it means to be an adversarial example, can we at least get a model that we know for sure is robust? So that was sort of the first challenge we had to overcome and we tried to think about robust machine learning because evaluation is no longer trivial. It's not just about taking a test set and looking at the performance, but once we start allowing these kind of worst case things, this puts us in a computational issue. So how does you know, one try to do certified robustness is, so what is the challenge here is that, so if you know, here's a pictorial illustration, 
So an input goes through the network and then you get predictions. So depending on which of the predictions, like either class one or class two is higher, the model gives an output. So when we make perturbations, so we might have this kind of very nice small ball of perturbations around the input. But if we trace what happens to each of these perturbed inputs through the network, we get this corresponding scores that's like that's this you know uh, really hard to reason about non-convex object because as we pass it through the network, there are all these non-linearities um, that makes this uh, output a non-convex object. So this makes it actually hard for us to know what is the behavior of perturbations in terms of how the model looks at it and its output. So what we said instead is like, well, maybe it's hard to reason about this particular like uh, exact non-convex object, but instead we could reason about a larger set, uh, which is convex and surrounds or encapsulates every, this, everything that actually comes from perturbations. So the idea here is that this object is easier to reason about because it's convex, we have a lot of analysis tools. But at the same time, if, any, if we show that this entire convex object is well-behaved, then we also know that everything inside it is well-behaved, which means that all the perturbations also are going to like not change the class. So if all this entire convex object lies in the correct class, then we have a guarantee that there's no way you can find an attack that's going to break it because you can prove that this convex object, which includes everything that comes from an attack is actually correct. So that's kind of the main idea of trying to use convex relaxations to get uh, sort of guarantees on robustness. So in this way, we can basically get an upper bound, which says that at least we know for sure that no one can break the model beyond this extent. It might be loose, but at least we know that it's not going to go below that amount. So how did that play out? So like, you know, kind of what happened in that space? So in 2013, like I said before, there were, you know, people started thinking about addressed examples and there's this little bit of a cat and mouse game. And in actually 2018, we, uh, along with uh, people at CMU, Zico, Coulter and others, uh, came up with this idea of trying to use convex relaxations that, um, you know, that can give you a guarantee on robustness. So at least you're not, uh, going to be broken by a stronger attack in the future. And the idea is that we, instead of, um, so we basically minimize this entire convex set, which means that we push the entire convex set to be in the right set of the space. And so that gives you a guarantee and makes the model good. So we minimize this sort of upper bound on robustness. And since then, there have been several successful applications of this idea. And like we have certainly improved the certified robustness. And uh, we're no longer like have to rely on people trying to break the model or we're no longer in this issue that like, well, is this model really not robust? At the same time, there are also a bunch of different methods that seemed empirically successful, but did not come with any guarantees. And like most things, you know, if you don't have guarantees, like the empirical performance is actually a lot better, but it's just that we don't know, we, we don't have a guarantee, but it seemed like it was pretty good. Um, and so that, you know, another line of work that, um, uh, like I and others started thinking about is, well, there are these methods that we know work. Can we prove something about them? Because they actually work a little better. So maybe that's a better strategy. And there's been some progress in that space. So basically SMT solvers solve essentially the same question, but they don't scale very well. They're not tailored to neural networks and the kind of architectures and setup that we have. So we came up with something based on semi-definite programming, which gave us a better relaxation and actually allowed us to scale things a lot more and prove things about empirically successful defenses. So things that people had independently come up with, we could prove that those are actually also good methods of attaining robustness. And kind of relying on the fact that we can differentiate through these uh, networks using modern GPUs and do that in a parallelizable fashion and so on, we had our custom SDP solver that actually allows us to prove pretty good guarantees about large scale networks. So not, not as large scale as we have today, but up, up to about like 20,000 nodes, which is still pretty large scale. So in this, so basically the summary is that via this idea of convex relaxations and bringing that to this uh, deep learning evaluation uh, to adversarial robustness, we've actually been able to at least uh, make progress on knowing whether we have solved the problem or whether we have made progress or not. And so we have some empirically successful defenses that we can prove are actually reasonably robust. And we also have like tailored methods to come up with guarantees as we train these networks. So at least we got a better handle on evaluation. And now we can actually go in and see like, has this solved the problem? Where are we? Like, what are the challenges, if any? So uh, this is a C410 uh, benchmark, in which we have to classify the images into one of 10 categories. 
and we can measure the standard error as well as the robust error, which is how well the model does if someone attacks the inputs. So, you know, we can do a lot better, but this is just like one representative ResNet model, which is reasonably small, but easy to run and you get good performance. Like your standard error has is only 4%. But like we saw earlier, the models are actually not robust. And so you can change them in some simple way and like by changing the pixels and they're going to easily break. Now we can see what happens when we do this robust training. So like I said, there are some methods that were empirically successful and like we could also prove something about. So like we have reasonable belief that they're actually are robust and that this robust error is somewhat accurate. But notice that the standard error has actually increased. So it's increased by almost three times, I'm sorry, more than three times. And there have been like a host of other, um, you know, robust training methods that people have come up with, but they all kind of show the same trend, which is that yes, the robustness does improve, but I, one thing is that the robust error has improved, but not, it's still not close to like the standard error we expect. Like it's still like about fifty percent of the examples, even though they are basically look the same, the model is getting confused by. But also the standard error has now increased by like three, four times, which is pretty problematic because how do we use these systems if they're actually getting worse at the original task itself? Because most examples are probably going to be normal. Like there are gonna be only a few attackers and protecting for the edge case, we cannot lose about four times performance on like the average inputs. So this was sort of one of the challenges when another challenge that comes up and we actually try to use this robust optimization framework and adapt it to training these models to be robust. So I wanted to show a very simple construction for sort of why this happens and what, you know, uh, there have been some progress that we can try to make on this. But I think this is interesting to think about, like, why does this even happen in the first place? Because my naive view going into it was if we make a model more robust to these meaningless changes, haven't we strictly made the model better because someone's telling the model that like, hey, if some pixels change or like a typo changes, don't change your prediction. So you should learn something better about the image. Um, okay, so here's a construction that shows some intuition for what might be going on. So let's say we had two classes um, and that somehow the distribution had this particular shape and the black classifier is the ground truth. So the data points are basically this excess and the ground truth classifier is the staircase like structure and that gives you the label of each class. So now basically label preserving transformations are like uh, these squares that I've shown here. So if we take an input and then perturb it to something within the square, then as per the ground truth, the label shouldn't change. So we want a model as well to be robust to these changes because these are changes that preserve the label. So if we did standard training, for example, via splines, where the idea is that the, the bias of the model is to fit the training data it, with minimum slope changes. So that's kind of the simple way of fitting the training data. And if we did that, what would happen? So let's say we had limited training data. What would happen is that the model learns this blue line because that's the way to perfectly classify your training set while um, you know minimizing your slope changes. So it's just a straight line. And this would work well, like it gets low standard error. In contrast, but okay, but this is not robust because if you actually draw boxes, they will intersect with the line and they actually change labels. So you can find perturbations which should have been label preserving but that this line will get wrong. And so we try to fix it. The way we fix it is, you know, we add these perturbations in the training set in an attempt to teach the model to actually obey the structure and learn to be robust. But if we use the same model that minimizes slope changes, what would happen is this is the classifier it would learn, this green line, because that's the way it can fit the training data with these augmented or like these perturbations that you've added in a way that still minimizes training data. Sorry, minimizes slope changes. So we have now made the model worse on these held out examples while well, the initial model actually got it right. And so here's an example where we wanted to make the model better by giving some information and trying to get some local robustness. But in the process, we have compromised on the global structure of the model. And so, you know, this, okay, so in one, yeah, so basically you learn the global structure, but maybe you compromise on the local structure, while robustness in to this particular adversarial examples try to fix the local structure, but in process compromises on the global structure, which leads to this kind of trade-off. They have to pick one or the other. And the natural question is, is there a way we can get best of both? And uh, again, very briefly, the idea is to use unlabeled data 
And unlabeled data is actually much easier to obtain. And so we can get large scale unlabeled data. And in fact, some of the most recent advances in machine learning also come from using these large scale unlabeled data. And the idea is that we can use this unlabeled data in a clever fashion to get both robustness and accuracy. And the idea is that, you know, in the first step, we first just think about standard accuracy and train a classifier. For example, we get this blue line. Now we use the blue line that we know is accurate, but maybe not robust, but it's accurate. And we can use that to get labels on this unlabeled data. So we get this fake or pseudo labels on the unlabeled data. And now with like much more da training data, we can do robust training. So if I notice here that if we do robust training with these pseudo labeled data points, now we can get both accuracy and robustness. So this is kind of the idea that maybe we can use large scale unlabeled data to improve robustness and accuracy and improve this trade off. And I don't, okay, I don't have the results here, but you know, it does help to some extent. So like instead of having a standard error of like 13, you now have a standard error of eight. So you've made some progress while still improving robustness as well. So the trade-off has improved as a consequence of using a lot of unlabeled data, but it's still not you know, really solved. And there are a lot of questions about, you know, whether maybe we haven't used enough unlabeled data or there's something else that's going on that we don't completely understand. So this has helped a little bit, but we still don't have a complete solution to get a model that's both robust and accurate to the extent that we want. Okay, so with that, I want to switch gears to another kind of uncertainty set of the set C of P and see what lessons we can take from that. So one um, you know, common problem that comes up in machine learning is that models can latch onto spurious correlations. So you have your training data up, and there are a lot of ways in which you can fit your training data. There are a lot of these misleading heuristics that might work on many examples, but they don't always work. And models do tend to pick up on those. So here's an example. So let's say we want to use ML for diagnosing whether this chest X-ray is collapsed or not, uh, has a collapsed lung or not. We can collect a data set, train a model, and see what happens. And when we do that, the model seems to work quite well. It correctly predicts that this has a collapsed lung. But on more careful examination, what we uh, or like what is seen is that the reason the model makes this prediction of a collapsed lung is because there is this treatment uh, or this chest tube, which is this line on the slide here, um, which given in that particular data set, it was just that everyone who was treated, who was detected, also received a treatment. And the model really picked up on the treatment as a way of detecting a collapsed lung. So now when you actually deploy it in the real world or like see what happens when you try to use this, it will fail to detect any untreated collapsed lungs, which is basically what we even wanted to train the model in the first place. So there are many such examples of spurious correlations that can occur, which the model is going to pick up on. And we can actually, in, in some nice work uh, from Pangwe, Shiori, and uh, Tatsu, and Percy from Stanford, they showed how you can rewrite this spurious correlation problem also in this robust optimization framework. But applying the same robust optimization hat, if we just like minimize this worst case error, like does that solve the problem? Again, the answer is no, they're actually pretty non-trivial things to think about. The first thing is the two uh, pictures on the top. So the usual tendency in machine learning today is to use the largest model that you can find. So if you look at the left plot, we see that the average error actually does decrease as we increase the size of the model. So the more you go on the right, the lower the error gets. But if you apply the same logic or the same intuition for robustness and train a model with this robust optimization, we see something actually quite reverse. Now we see that the models that are very large that are there on the right side have a higher error than the models that are small in the middle um, of the, or the bottom of the U. So this is kind of interesting because initially there's this in, like tendency to just train a large model, but we actually want to use that idea and like make things robust and throw in the robust optimization uh, objective. We actually realize that we need to make models smaller if we were to actually make that work. So one counterintuitive uh, observation is that large models seem to perform worse than small models. And going along the same line in, that IC, in an ICML paper, we investigated this and we found that if we really wanted to use a large model, here's another thing that you could do. So suppose you uh, suppose there are spurious correlations where say 90% of your data had that correlation and 10% didn't. So that's what these groups on the left up. So, so why is the label is the attribute. So on like 90% of the data points, the label matches the attribute. That is the treatment, for example, is present with the 
uh, fact that it's a collapsed lung. But in some cases, maybe they're untreated. And so you actually have a few examples where that's not the case. So if this is the distribution of data points, what happens is you use a large model, whatever optimization objective you try to do to make it robust, it seems like it doesn't work and you need to have a smaller model. But instead, if we artificially balance the data set, which basically means that we remove a lot of points where the correlation is, ho is holding, which is the top two plots, then we get a data set that looks more balanced, but is much smaller. So you've thrown out 90% of your data set, for example, so it's much smaller, but it's balanced. And in this case, now again, a large model seems to work better. So what this says is that you can have to either use a small model and compromise on model capacity and expressiveness, or you have to throw away a lot of data. And that's the only way you can try to make models such that they are less, you know, that where you can add the idea of robust optimization and actually improve robustness to these poorest correlations. So again, this is really interesting because A, it points out this kind of a trade-off again between accuracy and robustness, but also it tells us like we should do opposite things methodologically as well. In one case, we have a tendency of using as much data, as big models as you can, but then like we have to be careful as a slip side that if you actually try to make it robust and try to uh, do this robust training, we have to actually pick one of the two. We can't make models larger and we can't just use all the data that we have. And we have to actually remove data points that seems to help, or we have to regularize the model. So this was another example of sort of why just, even if you write down mathematically what you want and just optimize that objective, it's, it's very interesting when you try to think about how do we make deep networks robust because there are all these counterintuitive interactions that happen when we want to introduce this kind of robustness into modern uh, machine learning models. Okay, so going back to the quest, so this was a bit of a summary of uh, what I did like for a um, large chunk of my PhD. Those are the realizations over this journey of trying to write down mathematically what we want and then trying to do the to you know do the straightforward thing was that each step basically like we have you know we could try to write down different objectives and like put them together in some way but each time you try to do any kind of robustness it's actually very lossy so you do compromise in your accuracy you do not really get perfect robustness so we're not able to actually achieve this worst case formulation maybe it is really too conservative and so that got me interested in thinking about maybe, you know, having this worst case thing is really nice, it's really compelling, but maybe that's not the right objective, at least in the short term, maybe we should explore some ways of um, solving this kind of um, distribution shifts that actually occur in practice and that are not worst case. And maybe the, you can actually do a lot better that way. So, you know, so that led to another kind of uh, attack, which is, well, we want to build the fundamentals and understand how do we make things robust with this nice formulation where we can be concrete, where we can get guarantees, but maybe that's not like the most promising way in the short run. And are there, is there any benefit to actually looking at the distribution shifts directly? So that's kind of what I wanted to explore. So let's go back to the you know, uh, pipeline from before. So you have this training data, model architecture, training objective and evaluation. So first thing is, what does it even mean to be robust to natural shifts? One really nice thing about the robust optimization framework was if I wrote the set C of P, I knew exactly what I wanted and I can evaluate it. Even if it's intractable, at least I know what to evaluate. But now if I have a model and I say, I want it to work well on natural distribution shifts, like what does that mean? Like how do I even evaluate if the model is robust? That's the first thing that I'll uh, talk about. And then there's of course the notion of like, what is kind of the robustness or objective or the training data? So if you can't write the robust objective because you don't know what a natural shift is, what should we actually try to do when we train? So with that, I'll talk a little bit about how do we estimate accuracy under natural shifts? So like I said before, the nice thing about this uh, robust optimization framework was, yeah, it is worst case and yeah, it might be conservative, but at least I knew exactly what I wanted to evaluate and what I was getting. So the gold standard, if you wanted to evaluate your natural distribution shift, well, it's just like you collect data from your shifted distribution and see what your model does. But the problem with that is that if you needed to always get labeled data from your distribution shift, then you needed to have careful monitoring to know exactly what the shifts are, when you should get labels. And this is very expensive. You can't keep getting annotations for everything that your model is doing. So is there a way we can estimate uh, performance, but with unlabeled data? So maybe we can't get annotations each time, but when we deploy a model or we can just at least collect data, which is unlabeled and just see what the different uh, diverse 
conditions could be without annotations, but can we use that data to now tell us whether the model will work well on that distribution? So this is actually a pretty classical setup and people have shown that you can get bounds on how well a model you know, does out of distribution in terms of its in-distribution performance by some kind of a domain discrepancy, which measures how far one, the two distributions are from each other. So the farther they are, the more the performance could fluctuate, but if they're close to each other, then they track each other quite well. But when we actually try to use this, uh, or like calculate these, for most of the shifts that we have in practice, this actually becomes vacuous. And so this discrepancy is so large in terms of like whatever things that you can get guarantees on, that this doesn't tell us anything useful about how the model is going to work. So one thing, you know, one natural thing to first try is let's forget estimation. Let's see what actually just happens in practice. So we find this really striking observation where for many different shifts, so if you have the in-distribution accuracy versus out-of-distribution accuracy, it ideally should have been any, it should have oscillated within that discrepancy. But actually what we find is that they really nicely track each other. So if you look at the plot, it looks like here out of distribution accuracy is actually just a linear, like a linear transformation of in-distribution accuracy. So there is some like probit transform applied, but at a high level, intuitively they're basically like, uh, they, they just track each other perfectly. And this happens with many different distribution shifts. Like, so there's uh, this uh, this uh, FMOW wise, which is like the, from the wise data set, where they actually try to collect um, realistic distribution shifts. And then there's ImageNet v2, which was a re uh, ImageNet that they tried to get um, or like curate again to us test that to see how well it works. So it's trying to replicate ImageNet in some way. And there's like, you know, uh, all these synthetic uh, shifts that you can try to create, like fog. Then all of these different uh, observations, we see that they track each other really well. Of course, it doesn't always happen. So there's this one data set where performance is a little, like they don't track each other and we can't say that this happens in this particular distribution. So in some, most distribution shifts, we saw that they actually track each other quite well. So that's great. So that gives us hope that maybe it's not really that underspecified to say like, you know, maybe a natural distribution shift, there is so much structure that you can try to do something to at least estimate performance. But accuracy on the, or like the, the figures that we saw there are like not done yet because the slope and the bias of the line that in order to actually get the line itself, you need to know in distribution and out of distribution accuracy. So you do need labeled data for, uh, to obtain. So that was just a proof of concept. But we can extend this to replace accuracy with something called agreement. So I'm going a little fast to keep on time, uh, but basically there's an unlabeled metric that also shows a similar observations. So even without ground truth labels from the out of distribution, we just unlabeled data, we find a similar way of like, the, they track each other basically the same way as accuracy. And so we do have a pretty reliable method on these particular distribution shifts that we tested in practice to even at least say whether the model works well. Uh, so yeah, so basically it works much better than most existing methods. And we found that on many of the data sets, they do track each other well enough that we're getting pretty good estimation of what it means for the model to work based on just unlabeled data under this natural distribution shift where we didn't have a way to mathematically characterize what was going on. So this makes me you know, happy. I'm like, and it's, it's, it's promising that maybe there is something that we can say and do about natural distribution shifts because they do have a lot of structure. It's not as ad hoc. We just need to figure out what that structure is and what kind of guarantees make sense there. And you know, maybe we don't uh, have a way to write it down simply from the get go, but there is definitely something that we can do there uh, in order to get more principled approaches to get robustness to natural distribution shifts. Um, and of course, so we don't really, that's kind of what I said, like, can we look at why this method works and use that to tell us what exactly it is about these distribution shifts and about neural networks that allow, causes this to happen. And that will probably give us more guidance on what exactly are the shifts and methods that we need uh, for natural uh, shifts that occur in the, in the wild. And then I want to also talk about briefly about how do we improve robustness. So let's say we use accurate, we use some you know metric and find that the model actually doesn't work very well out of distribution, and that is true. So even models which are the latest and greatest models, even on natural distribution chips, they don't work very well. So what can we do to improve them? So one pretty promising approach to handle natural distribution chip is pre-training on diverse data. So here's the pre-training setup. So go and collect all the data that you can in the wild. So the idea here is that 
we can't write down mathematically what objective we want. We can't change the objective manually. So let's just get that information from data because after all, we want to be robust to naturally occurring things. So let's just collect natural data and use that to guide us on what, in what kind of robustness we want. So first let's just collect a lot of diverse, typically unlabeled data. And then there's a step one that is called pre-training. We use this data to like get a model. And then we adapt this using the labels that we have for whatever task that we want downstream. The idea is that maybe there is so much structure in this natural diverse data set that we had that already that kind of improves uh, the robustness of this model downstream. So that's the idea of the, that, that feels like that's a pretty natural way to think about how do we improve robustness to natural shifts. And this is definitely getting a lot of, um, you know, this is becoming the predominant paradigm actually, not typically for robustness, just for improving performance in general, but this is really important for robustness too. For example, if you have satellite remote sensing uh, and we have some training data from North America, but very limited data from say Africa, if we just relied on the standard machine learning model, which would be to just train on data from Africa, then we have the usual robustness problem. It's not gonna work well out of distribution. But instead, if we do pre-training, there's some hope that maybe the model has seen a lot of things about Africa, a lot of general natural images or unlabeled images, and knows something about what about the images matter? Like what are the different geographical conditions? And such a model might actually work a lot better out of distribution. And so, yeah, so the idea is that for natural distribution shifts, let us let natural data guide us on what to do. And this kind of pre-training, large scale pre-training substantially improves a lot of distribution performance. And it has been one of the most reliable methods uh, that actually improves robustness over many different shifts is by pre-training on as diverse data as you can. But how do we understand this? Like, what is there any hope of getting some guarantees or some understanding into like what this means? Like what happens when we just throw in data into a model? Like why does that work? What kind of data should we use and so on? So of course, several moving pieces. And very, very briefly, I'll show that we have, you know, there is some hope. We can actually try to get some understanding and improve performance too. Um, for example, by looking at this adaptation procedure, which is like, how do we take the pre-trained model and actually use it? So there are two typical ways of using a pre-trained model. One is to use change all your features and the other, which is called fine tuning. And the other is called linear probing where you keep features frozen and you only change like the linear heads. So in one, you change a lot of parameters in one, you don't change a lot of parameters. And so if you look at which model does, which method does better, if we purely focus on accuracy, it turns out that if you did fine tuning, which is that you change all parameters of the model, it works better than linear probing where you change only a few parameters because the more you can change, like you can actually fix your representations and like improve it and so it works better. But out of distribution, the reverse happens. So out of distribution, actually by changing fewer things, you're keeping your model more robust because whatever information it has learned from the pre-training, from the diverse data, it's preserved. And so that actually improves robustness compared to fine tuning where we change everything. And so an intuition for what happens here is, so let's say we had pre-trained features that actually had some notion of semantics of like how these data points relate. So we have two classes, we have in distribution, out of distribution. So because of pre-training, they like the, the representation somewhat capture what it means to be a cross and what it means to be a circle. And at the same time, it also separates them by region because after all, they are different. If you do fine tuning, what happens is, we initialize a linear head, which basically uses these representations and gets a classifier, but we initialize this randomly. And now when we propagate gradients through the entire network, the representations will also change in order to accommodate this linear head. So both of them will change in sync with each other each time you make gradient updates, and you end up with something like this, where in distribution is perfectly separated, things look great, but in the process, the features have changed in order to accommodate this linear head and the out of distribution features don't change because you're not training on those. And so this is of course simplistic, um, you know, they're not gonna be perfectly decoupled, but uh, for illustrative purposes, out of distribution points don't change the representations, in distribution points change, change to make the linear head work. But now if your linear head was initialized randomly, this could be whatever. And so the features change a lot and that leads to poor performance. But if we did linear probing, we kept things frozen, we didn't change anything. And so the model does actually retain whatever it knew about how X's and O's relate to each other. You don't get good performance in distribution as much as, um, sorry, fine tuning, because you haven't had the ability to improve the representations. 
So if your representation was not linearly separable because it's imperfect pre-training, um, then you don't have a chance to recover. So that's a downside. And then you can try to get the best of both, which is what we did, which is pretty intuitive. It is, we do want to change the representations in order to like make it say linearly separable to get good performance. But we don't want to do this blindly just to incorporate a random linear head. We actually just want to do it with purpose. So fine tuning does better in distribution because we have an ability to change, but it does worse out of distribution because they change a lot. The idea is that we do want to change the features, but we only want to change what is necessary. So the idea is that first, let's just linear probe, do not change the representations at all. But now we can change the representations if needed because yeah, maybe the representations should be better separated, but we're only changing that because uh, we want to make them better separated, not to fit a randomly initialized linear head, it was what's happening with fine tuning. And that works in practice as well. And it does improve both in distribution and out of distribution accuracy. So this is just like a proof of concept to say that there is a lot that we need to understand even when we go down this route of just pre-training on diverse data, because how do we retain the information that actually is that comes from this pre-training, that's a really important aspect. And of course, there are all the usual suspects, like what's the right architecture? How do we get the right diverse training data, pre-training data? What is the right objective that we should be pre-training? And all, you know, what is the right distribution of that we should collect downstream and so on. But this is really promising in terms of just empirical performance that if, uh, you know, this is a way in which we can actually improve performance a lot for these natural distribution chips. And yeah, so popping back up, uh, you know, kind of, I guess I'm a little over time. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, hopefully everyone here thinks that robustness in ML is really important, but it's pretty largely unsolved, though we've made some progress in terms of understanding both the foundations and trying to come up with ways that work in practice. So well-defined ships are great. They help us build the foundations. We can actually get guarantees and know what we're doing. But several natural ships also showcase enough structure, maybe, that we can get principled approaches, even if we don't have the formal guarantees. It'd be really good to like get the best of both or like find the middle ground between guarantees and natural ships. But then I want to thank all my wonderful collaborators. The first authors are highlighted here and Open Philanthropy for um, supporting a lot of this research. Thanks, and I'll take questions. So I see some questions in the Q&A here. Okay, so one question that I see is, have you or other researchers uh, explored test set example-based weights or costs when evaluating robustness while minimizing error. Uh, for example, it may be more expensive to misclassify an innocent man as a criminal. Yes, so I think this is definitely something that people are thinking about, and this especially makes more sense in the structured setting. So, if, okay, so if you just look at labels, it might be easy to like just have a different weight uh, function for the different classes. And I think that will pretty naturally fit into whatever formalism and math that we have, and you can just, you know, uh, process that. But I think the setting where this becomes even more interesting is the structured setting, where let's say we're trying to output a sentence and now this is toxic or not, and there's like a lot of things that can go on. So there it actually becomes a lot more difficult because how do we judge how toxic something is or not is actually you know pretty intractable in itself. And so that it is interesting to think about what is the right uh, you know robustness metric that we should have in these cases where the dangerous or like the danger can actually you know vary quite a bit. Um, and then the other question is, if the pseudo labels turn out to be wrong, would unlabeled data help? Yeah, so um, this only kind of makes sense if we are in a setting where the models are pretty accurate. So in some sense, if your model is not at all not accurate, there's like really no reason we should hope to make it robust in the first place. And so this is really in that setting where things are accurate, but not robust where this helps. But that said, it's not like it's gonna get worse. So if you have a 60% accurate model and you have unlabeled data, it's not gonna get worse than 60%, but you're not gonna see the gains that you would get if you started with the model with 95%, which is kind of the regime that all of the experiments that I showed in were. And how can we make guarantees with pseudo label or unlabeled data? So of course we can make you know distributional assumptions and prove certain things like for Gaussians and so on. But for the real world, uh, we can do the usual, I mean, like in terms of evaluation, you still get guarantees, but in terms of whether this method should work or not, we just have to empirically check. But we can definitely prove things about like, show that it provably helps um, in uh, like for simple models. Is the linear field of accuracies on distribution shifts observed only neural networks? Okay, so it's a good question. So there are two aspects. So one is that if you look at just the accuracy, 
the linear fit is actually observed across many different models, not just neural networks. So you actually see it over, you know, KNNs, uh, SVMs, and so on. And that's really interesting that they all lie on the same line. But if you look at the agreement, which I guess I went a little fast on, but that's the way in which, so accuracy requires labels. So if we actually operationalize this to use it to predict uh, accuracy using unlabeled data, so the disagreement of the models, that changes for different models. So for, we find that only for neural networks does the disagreement line match the accuracy line. And that, that's the only case where we can actually use this method to get, um, uh, what do you say, to predict accuracy. So for other models, interestingly, the disagreement doesn't match the accuracy. Yeah, so to summarize, the accuracy fit happens across all data sets, but the disagreement matching accuracy only happens on neural networks. Thank you for the very interesting talk, Aditi. Um, I also actually have a follow-up question on the pseudo labels. So it seems to suggest that if you increase the amount of data, you become more robust. Uh, is it true that if your amount of data goes to infinity, your robust accuracy and your actual accuracy will converge together, or is there always going to be a gap? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on your mental model. Like for me, it feels like there should be because, you know, you don't care about robustness to points that don't exist. So that is one thing. And the other, or like where there's no probability mass, if you're like impossible to see those points, then we don't care about it. And then the other thing is that we are introducing these perturbations in a way that actually preserves the label. So there has to be the optimal like thing has to be like robust as well, because if there was a clash then we wouldn't care, right? So if this image actually looked like something else then we don't want it to like preserve its label. So given those assumptions, it feels like with infinite data, it should work. But then like in high dimensional cases, I guess like, you know, what is infinite is actually like pretty non-trivial to think about. Um, so yeah, in practice, uh, we so we ran one experiment where like we subsampled. So rather than collecting more labels, we just like you know uh, took less labels and tried to see what happens. And we do see that the gap between standard and robust accuracy, sorry, a gap between the accuracy of standard training and accuracy of robust training, they kind of go down as we increase the number of labels. Yeah. Interesting. So um, in this line of work, a lot of people sort of say, well, hey, we're using these attack models that you know these owl. Owl, owl something, norm balls, um, uh -huh. right, your example, right, in which you drew the boxes, you can right. argue that, right, the robustness is tied to the shape of the balls. Um, could you comment on sort of this, this kind of argument that maybe we're not looking at the right kind of attack models, maybe it's a different thing that we should be looking at? Would, would your results still hold for, you know? Yeah, I think um, okay, so there's like the issue is if you could write down mathematically what you want or like some formal way of what you want, so maybe not necessarily even mathematical, maybe it comes from a generative model, but you have like some programmatic way of getting that, then I would imagine, I mean, I haven't tried it, of course, but I my sense is that all of these results will still hold. Um, but then the question of like, how do we design the, can we get programmatic ways of defining realistic shifts? Like, I guess the answer is probably no for most cases. Um, so I guess that would be the gap, I think. So that is the harder part, but I think most of the um, intuition kind of ho holds as long as you can do this kind of training um, by generating perturbation. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And thank you to all the uh, attendees for coming to the talk. Thank you very right, much. Thanks. thanks for having me. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.